Understanding trust, honoring roles and leadership by Iqbal Nassim. <clears throat> we all have duties towards the communities and organizations that we are a part of, but we really acknowledge and deal with them with the importance, sincerity, and the dedication that they deserve. This workshop will address the reality of taking on a role, the importance of upholding this kind of trust, and how to go about fulfilling the trusts that come with the positions of leadership with Ihsan, excellence. <clears throat> I think this is very pertinent for a lot of people here who will, who are currently in and who will very soon pursue leadership roles, inshallah. Brother Iqbal, sorry, I don't know why I said it like that. Brother Iqbal is Chief Executive of National Zakat Foundation, the UK's only local zakat platform, and is also the founder of Transform My Prayer, a project launched at the end of 2019 to help Muslims achieve greater consistency, focus, and tranquility in their five daily prayers. He's recently done a video with Ustad Hisham that we really recommend you watch. Both of these excellent speakers have uh, come together and done a recent video. So, uh, with no further ado, Brother Iqbal, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you? We're very well. How are you? I'm good, alhamdulillah. Um, all right, okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. I begin in the name of Allah, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy. All praise belongs to Allah, Lord of all that exists. And may the blessings and peace of Allah be upon the most noble of his prophets and messengers, Muhammad, his family and all his companions. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy and blessings of Allah be upon uh, all of you. Uh, so welcome to this uh, to this workshop. Um, I uh, understand that because of the uh, the reason that some uh, one of the other speakers had to drop out that the format has slightly changed. So my understanding is, so correct me if I'm wrong, that I'm delivering this once, not twice. Is that correct? Uh, and also that this will end uh, roughly. When do you want this to end? Three thirty? Is that right? Three thirty, three forty. Just help me, just to um, if you. Um, so three forty, inshallah, Okay, three forty, yeah. and I'm doing it once, right? Not twice. Correct, correct. All right, excellent. Okay, so my uh, my plan had been not, not to speak for too long, uh, which uh, for me is a challenge, but my plan was not to speak for too long. Uh, and then really to open it up, you know, to as many um, uh, questions and as much interaction as, uh, um, you know, as possible, just because I think that's where we'll get most out of it. And you can, uh, given that each year, obviously, I'm a year, uh, I'm a year more distant from the university sort of life and reality of university life. Uh, I don't want to be speaking, uh, you know, as a uh, as an old fogey in an irrelevant kind of way. I want to try to address obviously the issues and the concerns that you have specifically. Um, I used to be uh, in in Islamic society at university. I was uh, first a treasurer within a couple of months, and because the only qualification you needed was uh, basically to be studying economics, right? So everyone thinks that if you study economics, somehow you're going to be a good treasurer, whereas of course uh, that's not necessarily the case. Um, this is basically I... Sami's life story with Isaac. Oh, really? Is it? Okay, yeah. exactly. We're just clones. We're clones of each other. Um, so, uh, yeah, so treasurer and then vice president uh, the next year and then president in my in my final year. So I had a full, uh, full Islamic society kind of uh, uh, involvement at the time. And prior to that and since then, I've always found myself uh, fortunately or unfortunately in various kind of leadership positions. So alhamdulillah, I can speak with a fair amount of experience, I think. Uh, and um, and I suppose experience, not just of the uh, responsibilities, but, you know, the challenges, the difficulties, the internal kind of dramas, you know, that we go through uh, when we occupy any form of, uh, I suppose, leadership role, responsibility, uh, you know, as part of a group or a team uh, or where we have responsibility over others or simply in an individual capacity. So uh, I'm sure uh, I'll just to sort of now begin my kind of opening um uh, my opening comments and as we go through if you want to populate you know the chat group with uh, any of your kind of questions or what have you please feel free um, I would welcome you know like an audio kind of questions but if that's logistically difficult you know then then no problem um, so uh, I'll say some opening comments and then in for five ten minutes and then inshallah hopefully you have some questions and if you don't we can all uh, we can all stop a little early uh, no problem okay so I'm sure that so far, somewhere in the midst of this uh, this session that has been, uh, you know, kindly organised by FOSIS, uh, that the uh, that the subject or or the verses of the Quran towards the end of Surah Al-Ahzab have come up. They must have come up somewhere, right? So these are the verses where Allah says, "Inna aradna al-amanat ala samawati wal ardi wal jibal." That we presented the trust, the amana, to the heavens uh, and the mountains and the earth. 
uh, but they refused to take this trust on minha, and they were afraid of doing so and instead mankind uh, bore this trust uh, uh, man has often been uh, foolish and uh, inept with regards to this trust so this verse has come up right so anyone who's on a video you nod you go discuss this verse or not you have okay brilliant okay good stuff so this verse has come up now, I'm not going to go, you know, I'm sure wh whoever has brought it up has already spoken about it at length, so I'm not going to go into it too much. But what I do want to do is address this, the, the next verse, okay, that comes immediately afterwards, that con concludes this particular chapter of the Qur'an, because in that, basically, uh, you know, it gives us an indication of the ways in which we can, uh, you know, go, go wrong and go right, basically, with regards to um, bearing any form of trust so there is the macro amana if you like yeah the big amana that all human beings uh, hold the, 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 that amana is one where uh, it is simply the choice uh, that we have uh, the ability to choose between either fitting into the overall divine order which is uh, described uh, in the quran as an order of islam of submission subservience uh, of tasbih, of glorification, of salah even, right? So salah and tasbih and Islam, Allah tells us, is going on all over the place, all over the universe. We as human beings, and perhaps others, uh, you know, there are other beings out there too, we don't know, but we as human beings at least, and jinn, but as human beings, we have the choice as to whether we want to fit into the rest of this order, which now the heavens and the earth and the mountains all fit into, or we don't. Yes, yeah? so that's at a macro level. On a micro level, we then have, uh, we then take on additional trusts, yeah, if you like, within the context of that large trust to try and, I suppose, uphold and to do as best as we can in fulfilling that ultimate, uh, the ultimate responsibility. OK, so whether it's a role at Islamic society or particular on any X, Y, Z organization, you know, some form of leadership. So let's describe or understand leadership as somebody who uh, exerts any form of influence. OK. Any form, any form of influence. So it's not actually necessarily related to like your position necessarily or the title that you hold. Yeah, forget all that. Okay, that's not really uh, of what's of most interest. The idea is that you have made a conscious decision, okay, to uh, to try and bring about some sort of positive influence that, in your understanding, you know, aligns with what Allah wants from you and the best that you can offer. Okay, so that's basically what it is. And then in that context, you will you maybe enter this role, that role, the other role. All right. So it's exerting influence. And then one of the one of my favorite quotes with respect to leadership or how to describe a leader is somebody who knows the way, goes the way and shows the way. Yeah, somebody who knows the way, goes the way and shows the way. And the reason I like this one is for a number of different reasons. But first of all, it puts the whole thing in the context of a path and of a journey. So if all human beings are tasked okay, with going on, uh, traveling on this straight path, yeah, the first thing we need to do is to know the way and, and go the way, you know, at least to the extent, at least to the extent that us showing the way that makes us showing the way possible. OK, so sometimes, you know, when we when we take our positions of responsibility, we don't really think about whether we are actually, you know, like sort of ready or qualified to take them on. And I don't just mean at a kind of like on an emotional level of where, you know, the intention is difficult to, you know, to, to handle and all of these kinds of things. Fine, that's all important. And we need to, you know, explore that, obviously. Uh, but I just mean really practical terms. Like, do you actually have the requisite knowledge and understanding? And are you yourself living in such a way that is consistent with the way that you want to show others what you're trying to facilitate for others? Yeah, the positive influence that you're trying to exert. Because if you don't, or... Accordingly, that's where basically things uh, can go right or wrong. And that's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, after he says that he's presented this whole trust okay, to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, they haven't taken it on. They were afraid of it. People have taken, taken it on. People show a, either vulm, be, may, some form of injustice or wrongdoing, or jahl, some form of ignorance. Right? Then he says what? لِيُعَذِّبَ اللَّهُ الْمُنَافِقِينَ وَالْمُنَافِقَاتِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ وَالْمُشْرِكَاتِ So he will then... After everything is done and dusted, punish two types of people, men and women. Yeah, those who show uh, the qualities or, or manifest shirk or nifaq in some way. So let's take shirk and nifaq outside of their traditional kind of, you know, uh, classical or sort of theoretical kind of descriptions. What does it mean in the context of, of the path and of leadership and of trust? It means that either you weren't really serious about it, so that is nifaq and hypocrisy, or 
that you were so so uh, so you were demonstrating something but you weren't it wasn't actually true it wasn't a real thing that you actually felt um strongly about uh, or that you complicated you, the journey by pursuing other goals alongside pursuing the path to Allah himself and facilitating the path to him so there were other things going on okay there were or there were other true motivations or motivations that trumped that if you like so that is nifaq and shirk and then the other option is and then Allah will forgive the true believing men and women, those who are true to their trust. And then necessarily as a consequence of them having iman and them having true uh, faith and conviction that they were then trying to facilitate the path for others. And it's interesting that Allah says he will forgive them. He doesn't even say at this place that he will reward them. Yeah, that's a given. But Allah often does this in, in, in all over the Quran. You see that after describing the good qualities of believers that the believers demonstrate, the first thing he always talks about oftentimes is his forgiveness, even though he hasn't just described anything that they apparently did wrong. Right. In this case, he's saying, They have been true believers, but he will forgive them first. Why? Because it's to remind us and to put into us the humility that we will necessarily make mistakes and go wrong, even if we're trying to do the right thing. Yeah, even if we don't contain possess, you know, hypocrisy or shirk, you know, like um, uh, being, you know, untrue, if you like, or going uh, or pursuing other goals on top of the or beyond the goal that we have uh, stated that we want to pursue. Even if we go and do other things, then you know, uh, we will make mistakes, we will make errors. So Allah will uh, uh, relent to us, and He will grant us His tawbah. Wa kana Allahu ghafoor rahima and Allah is the most forgiving, the most uh, merciful, the one who gives. Uh, much uh, of his mercy and his loving care and compassion so when it comes now to the issue of you know the the responsibilities okay of of trust in summary what i'll say be frankly and that's pretty much all i'm going to say before we go before we before we go hopefully into some interaction and questions and to for you to raise the specific challenges that you face with respect to this topic is Whatever your position is, whatever your topic is, uh, whatever your yeah, your area of responsibility or your position or w- whatever it is now or what it will be, like just ask yourself always, yeah, do I know the way and am I going the way? Do I know the way and am I going the way, right? Before I can show the way. And fundamentally, what is it to be a Muslim leader? Yeah, how do you describe what what is it to be a Muslim leader? A Muslim leader is the one who goes on the straight path. And facilitates the straight path for as many people as possible. That is leadership, yeah. In our context, that's the only kind of leadership that matters. Any other form of leadership is 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 kind of irrelevant, really, yeah. Unless at the heart of it, it's somehow linked to uh, going on that path to Allah yourself and facilitating it for others. And that facilitation has many, many manifestations. Of course, there are many ways to do that, right? So it's not just one thing. It's not just in our minds we think of preachers and da'wah, and then that you know, in some very narrow understanding, and then that's all. No, there are a number of different ways that that can manifest. Of course, but the point is, is that you are doing something that uh, shows by way of your example, by way of your instruction, by way of your guidance, uh, the um, the way to go basically yeah gives people a sense of direction especially in a time when you know uh, confusion is rife yeah like all over the place like human beings are in an increasingly messed up state right to put it bluntly so the need for leadership and the need for truly muslim leadership meaning leadership that is rooted in a commitment to allah and a commitment to facilitating the path to him such that hearts can find rest in this life and enter paradise in the next right this much needed but you need to be pursuing that path yourself. You need to be doing the things uh, to develop your knowledge, uh, you know, your, to increase in your worship, develop your knowledge. Um, and when I say knowledge, I don't mean, again, just sort of in a general Islamic knowledge kind of way. I mean, in ways that are specific to the roles that you have. So if you are a treasurer of an Islamic society, for example, where you better know properly how to fundraise, you better know how to account for things. Yeah, you better know how to do all of these things. Yeah, don't be like me or, you know, all I was was a, doing, you know, an economics undergraduate, don't have a clue about anything. And then, you know, you sort of get in. What I'm saying is even if you take on the role, you take and you know you're not fully qualified for it, but you take seriously the fact that you want to be, that you're going to get more qualified on it. So you have a, one of the ways that you know, you know, that you're, that you're doing this is that you, you're demonstrating a natural curiosity and a desire and investing the time, maybe even the money, right, to improve your skill set in such a way that allows you to be better at the thing that you're actually doing. Yeah. Like many of us, we can, might occupy positions in an Islamic society or whatever, but we never actually invest anything in ourselves 
to you know to actually kind of really specifically improve for the specific role that i have for example so that's an important important thing to uh to to do so yes there is learning on the job i think as someone has mentioned in the chat but you know um there's learning on the job by experience but there's also learning learning right outside of that yeah uh, and sort of uh, which is important to pursue at the same time so i would definitely uh, you know bear that in mind as well as then constantly you know going the way but are and are requesting feedback as well yeah, getting feedback being open to feedback you know having what they call this growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset you know someone who's very open to the idea that they will go wrong that they're there to serve a certain customer base if you want to put it that way so as in the corporate world or in kind of general um uh, you know sort of business talk right you need to know your customer so yes in the context of leadership there's a certain direction yeah that you want to take people in but you need to know where they're at you need to understand them you need to empathize with them sometimes you know islamic societies and other such spaces can become quite quickly sort of you know very strange judgmental kind of spaces where basically we think we have all the answers we think everybody else is clueless you know and it becomes very kind of um uh, you know, one way kind of traffic in terms of, you know, a messaging, but there isn't really often a conversation that takes place. You know, we don't allow people oftentimes to come to come into that space, make it a welcoming kind of space, understand where they're at, and then gently give them an idea of where we're trying to get to together, yeah, as a group of uh, believers and uh, wider as well. So I think these are important uh, principles or aspects of take of knowing or feeling more confident, I suppose, to, to the fact that you're taking your trust seriously. Right. Um, and of course, as part and parcel of that, and this is the last thing I'll mention, which is that your private interaction and conversation with Allah needs to be of a much higher standard and a much higher quality. Yeah. Um, one thing I'll mention is the fact that, you know, in the context of the um, the project, which was mentioned in, in the introduction that I've been sort of managing for the last uh, uh, year or so, which is called Transform My Prayer. So it's just an effort to help people, you know, improve their understanding, and their practice of Salah. Right. Salah is just one example of a form of interaction communication between us and Allah. Right. It's probably the most important. And after that, you have various forms of dhikr, of remembrance, of dua, supplication, etc. Yeah. The way in which we do these things oftentimes doesn't reflect a true relationship with Allah. Oftentimes the way we talk to Allah and relate to him and act in front of him in our prayers and outside doesn't actually give us true sense of the fact that we really believe he's there. You know, so things like, for example, for people like yourselves, who perhaps are people who either are in or will be in positions of leadership, it is not good enough. Yeah. I mean, let's learn for anybody, but certainly not to for, for yourselves. It's not good enough, you know, for example, to uh, to be rushed through, to rush through your prayers, to say things in your prayers that you don't understand, uh, to not to talk to Allah, you know, in, in, in a most natural way about the problems and the difficulties you're experiencing and asking him for his help before you go anywhere else. Yeah. So that you really feel you're in some degree of a partnership with the one to whom you're, you're claiming that you're taking everyone towards. Right. You know, that your interaction, your relationship needs to be one which is real, not one which is based on simply a kind of rote, you know, uh, sort of understanding, purely memorization, but no real kind of depth basically behind or substance behind what it is that you're saying and the way in which you're saying it. Yeah. So cultivating your relationship with Allah. Yes, through obviously the traditional ways, but in meaningful ways, you know, through a true understanding of the Quran, not just through recitation, through a true conversation and a true heartfelt expression in your prayer, not just going through the motions, yeah, through actual supplication. And for most of us in language, in a language that we understand, because Allah created all languages. I mean, that's one of his signs. He says so. So why don't you talk to Allah in a language that you understand in the way that you think and dream and talk to everybody else in? Because that's the way you're most likely to express yourself most fully. So yes, learn all the prophetic supplication, Quranic supplication, do all of that stuff. I'm not saying not to do that, but you're unlikely to be able to express to Allah, you know, in, in very particular terms or intimate terms, the things that you're experiencing, unless you ex do so in the, your own language. So why don't you do that then? So these are also really important parts of, uh, of, the, um, of the picture as well, in terms of helping you uh, build a greater depth of, I suppose, sincerity, connect, sincerity and connection uh, to Allah, and then allowing you to, uh, inshallah, giving you the strength and insight into how you will bring others uh, along in that journey with you. Um, so that's all I'll say for now. 
Zatan Lachin obviously went slightly over, but I said, did say it was a bit of a challenge. But we've got half an hour, uh, basically, or up to half an hour for you to ask any questions. It could be if you feel I've missed the mark and there's something else that you want to address, then you know, feel free, basically. So feel free to put your questions forward um, on the chat group or uh, I don't know if you can raise your hand and be unmuted or whatever. That can happen too. Uh, yeah, any of the two approaches will be fine. Um, people start uh, sending your questions through the chat, please. I don't think we've got Slido set up. Have we got Sam for this? Uh, I think there was a discussion about it just in the brother who I was talking to before. Um, All right, there we go. Okay. okay. You can also Please use, uh, use the Slido. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, join the Slido if you want to ask it anonymously. Oh, there we go. How then do you know if you're quali qualified enough to be a leader? Yeah. So at one level, like, you know, at one level, none of us are qualified, right? But so it's interesting, right? So let's look at the Quran. When you look at the Quran, it's like, um, uh, uh, let's take the example of Musa, alayhi salam. Yeah. Musa, alayhi salam, didn't consider himself to be qualified. In fact, when the first time he is receiving, I mean, this is when he's receiving direct communication with Allah. His first um, interactions are such that he's like, you know, I'm not ready for this, basically. You know, I, I can't speak properly. I've, uh, you know, I've basically killed one of their people. You know, I need, may, I need, I need my brother alongside me. You know, he was basically putting forward all of these things, right, to say that he's not ready. So, in in one sense, you know, who is ready to take on this amana, really? Yeah. Um, but in another sense, I think it's just, as I said, it's to get to the particulars and just have a real, maybe sometimes develop a better appreciation for the actual, um, for the actual. Uh, a particular role. So when I was talking about qualification, I'm talking about for the particular role that you're going for, that you are aspiring towards, perhaps. And we'll talk about the issues of like, you know, uh, aspiration and all the rest of it in a second as to whether you should or shouldn't aspire for these things. Yeah. Um, like uh, just to just to, uh, you know, appreciate or to, un or to to kind of look further into, OK, what does this particular thing require? Yeah. And then as you're going through a role, yeah, in terms of your your leadership, then to constantly, as I said, have, you know, have ideally, you know, a mentor or mentors, peers, um, and 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 in interact with the people that you are serving with a view to uh, improving constantly, getting feedback constantly, sharing your difficulties and problems constantly, and learn and therefore learning basically how you can uh, how you can develop, how you can improve, how you can be better. So there are the kind of like the discrete types of kind of qualifications, if you like, for certain things where I need a requisite amount of you know, technical knowledge, perhaps, or whatever. It might be certain, perhaps sometimes a degree of experience in such and such a thing. Um, but uh, so it's a judgment that needs to be made, basically. Right. So I would certainly not have the view that, you know, like ab abandon everything and don't take on anything. Yeah. I don't think that we have the luxury, frankly, for that. Yeah. Um, like you, we need people to be proactive uh, in uh, taking on responsibilities. But it just needs to be, you know, uh, one should just take that. Sometimes we rush into these things and we don't think them through properly. Yeah. And as long as we are clear in our heart about what we want, you know, sometimes I say to, I say to people, look, as long as when you're on your own, you're in private, you can look up to the heavens. Right. And you can you can literally speak to Allah directly and you can say, you know, Allah, the reason I'm doing this or I want to do this is for your sake. And if it's the best thing for me, then facilitate it for me. Right. So you can actually say that in a way that you feel that I'm not bluffing here. I really mean it in terms of my intent. I'm true about what is the reason why I want to do this. Yeah. And uh, and then obviously you look at the specifics and, you know, in terms of what's required and see if you can actually either meet those criteria or develop, you know, the skills that are required. How to deal with conflicts or problems between members in an ISO? Well, of course, it, uh, you know, it can get very um, it can get very difficult and um, uh you know, there's lots of specific angles we could explore depending on what the situation is. But I think one of the best ways for con the best thing for conflict resolution, I would say as a principle or as a starting point is like zoom out of the specific issue and and whoever's trying to mediate or facilitate the situation. Remind everybody like what the point of all of this is in the first place. Yeah. And separate between the people and the problem. Oftentimes we like to say the people are the problem. OK. And it might very much feel that way sometimes. But assuming that we can all be on, we all, you know, we all uh, agree or we all, um, uh, we all believe that we're all in it, you know, in such and such a thing for the right reasons and that the basic intentions of people are in the right place, then there's no conflict that shouldn't be able to be resolved. Yeah, that we come together, we separate between the people and the problem. Let's put the issue 
on, 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 the, on, the, on the table and look at that issue on the decision with respect to the actual vision that we are pursuing here. So some, you know, if you have actually a written kind of vision statement, if you like, that helps um, you guide like your direction, it's very helpful in these circumstances because then your, um, uh, uh, because then basically you can, you know, it acts as a filter, right? For each kind of small or large decision that you, that you need to take uh, separately. So that's certainly something that I would, um, uh, you know, recommend. Zoom out, look at this issue in the context of the vision, and then, and then like try to as much as possible, you know, make sure that you're, again, we're not, because we're looking at the problem and the issues and not the people, that we, that we are ready, especially anyone who's mediating or facilitating this, like we're ready to take, you know, good ideas from people that we don't get along with because we're only looking at them in the context of what pragmatically, like what's going to work and what makes most sense in the context of the direction we want to go in. Right. Um, and empathize you know, and show empathy and understanding for people's contributions. Right. Before a decision is made. And obviously where you have an actual in these contexts, you need obviously a leader practically pr to make a final decision on things. And it's also for those people whose opinions are not adopted. Right. To make sure that they suppress their egos and go with the decision that has been made by a leader or by a majority, depending on how a decision is being made. Yeah, because it's unlikely, it's unlikely, right? Usually, usually our, we narrow like the set of possibilities to a very small set of possibilities and anything outside of that, you know, is somehow wrong. But usually the truth is that actually there's a, a huge range of possible actual valid options. And we have a very strong opinion about a certain part of it, you know, and others may be elsewhere in that. If a majority or the leader in the situation makes a decision, having consulted and everything else, then we should go with that. You know, stick with the unity of that. There's a place for leadership. And of course, you know, um, going going with that, unless they constitute some form of gross, you know, uh, irresponsibility or major injustice, then of course, you know, then, then we don't. But uh, otherwise, um, you know, we sh we, it's important that uh, followers, you need, you need good followers in different circumstances, as well as good leaders, right? And I don't mean that, again, bound to specific positions always, but everybody who's a, who is a leader and exerts influence also needs to be able to follow and go with a group at the same time so inshallah like these things will uh, you know help and of course uh, the answer to all of these things ultimately comes down to you know supplication and asking Allah to facilitate uh, how to balance personal life with responsibilities and not letting your personal life affect or seep into your responsibilities yeah so you know I don't um, personally <laughs> personally uh, myself I don't like to look at um, uh, look at my life uh, in that way where I look at personal life and responsibilities like at one level, like what's actually the difference, you know, isn't it just one life? Like you're leading one life. Yeah. So when you say balance your personal life and your responsibilities, all you need to do is, you know, your personal life is your responsibility and your responsibilities constitute your personal life. Like it's you, right? It's you, still you in that space doing whatever you're doing. So I actually think that first of all, removing that, um, removing that kind of uh, framework for thinking about these things is probably the first step to dealing with it. Um, we do need to look at, it's more about then priorities. Yeah. Priorities being realistic with and uh, looking, considering the things that we want to do. Yeah. And making sure that we don't take on more than we can actually, we don't bite off more than we can chew basically. Right. We don't take on more than we can do justice to. So if there are, when we, if for example, we mean, Oh, personal life, my, you know, perhaps you might mean your personal re uh, relationships with your family members, your studies, for example, these kinds of things you know, versus responsibilities, oh, Islamic society, FOSIS, blah, 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 whatever, right? Um, I don't know, like for me, I see them all as one, yeah? I have responsibilities towards myself, towards my family members, uh, towards, um, uh, you know, towards wider community society, right? And all of that, of course, as a part of a wide, uh, an overarching responsibility to God himself. So it's just to prioritize within all of that, yeah? Like, you know, you can let your personal, you, so what you describe as your responsibility in your personal life, it then doesn't get into that kind of, um, it doesn't get into that kind of tension one or the other. There's a whole host of things that are competing with each other for your time. Be realistic about the time that you have, the objectives that you have, um, and don't commit to more than you can, uh, don't commit to more than you can, um, uh, than you can handle basically, right? Because otherwise the issue of balance doesn't really kind of come up because once you've, once you've only filled or taken on as much as you think you can handle, then it's just a question of, okay, you're scheduling, how do you manage your week and just being trying to be disciplined about that. Yeah. Um, we typically all have more time than we think we have because we actually, 
so oftentimes a lot of us especially students right uh, with risk with the greatest respect to you all right we we often waste our time a lot of our time so we often do things you know socially and otherwise that you know fine there's a play, time and place for all of that but actually just gets in the way and and, and loses us a lot of time and then later on we're asking ourselves well, how do i balance you know i'm suffering in my studies how do i balance basically between this and that um so i think that you know uh, there is enough time uh, and there is uh, enough possibility for us to kind of prioritize appropriately. I mean, these questions, that question probably requires a session in, it own, in its own self, but I would probably start with, uh, start with some of what I've just mentioned. How do we protect ourselves from unintentional hypocrisy? Well, um, uh, there is a famous uh, supplication of the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recommended, right? Allahumma inni a'udhu bika minan ushrika bika shayin a'lamu wa astaghfiruka lima la a'lamu. That Allah, I take refuge in you um, from the uh, from the possible associations I make uh, with you uh, and uh, I uh, seek your forgiveness for the ones that I don't know about. Yeah. Um, so making this supplication i think this is uh, important that's number one thing and number two is that your uh, private your what you do you should always have something some things that you do in private that no one knows about yeah that helps um after you after you are doing something in the public sphere right um and you mention and you you know you, you do things in something in the public sphere where basically either you are congratulated for you know people uh, or you feel good about right in front of people you feel a sense that you know your reputation or your name isn't somehow now in a better place you know with others then again there's the other supplication uh, and you can you know whether you say in arabic english whatever rabbi la tu akhidni bima yaqulun ya Allah, my lord don't take me to account because of what they say ma la ya'lamun and forgive me uh, for the things that they don't even know about. Make me better than they think I am. Yeah, in reality. Uh, another one, Allahumma ja'alni fi aynayya saghira ke fi uyun nasi kabira. That make me small in my own eyes, even though I may be big in the eyes of the people. So there are a number of these kind of things. It's an attitude and it's an approach. You know what it is? It's like, you know, if you know yourself, if we know ourselves, we know that we are very flawed. We know that we have a lot of mistakes, right? And to be cognizant of those constantly seeking Allah's forgiveness for those things um and just con just checking ourselves you know each time doing something privately to co to com to combat or to i suppose um complement if you may perhaps is a better word complement the things in that we do in public which are at greater risk of you know um perhaps hypocrisy ostentation etc so it is tough it's a challenge um and for some people can become you know sometimes overwhelming uh, although you know it's in I think the way to combat it is to, if you develop a true, a, tr a much deeper and more genuine interaction with Allah in your private life, if you want to put it that way, private, you know, you, the times when you're away from others, then your ability to deal with this issue, generally speaking, and for it not to overwhelm you becomes a lot more possible. Allah knows best. Right. Are you allowed to want or apply for positions of leadership, given we are naturally predisposed to jah uh, jahala and adhulm? Yeah. So, um, yes. Uh, so, you know, uh, to put uh, to put one's to put oneself forward uh, for the um, uh, to put oneself forward uh, for specific positions for the sake of you know to desire position for the sake of the position itself for the associated fame for the associated you know whatever right material or worldly kind of benefits to desire it for those reasons is obviously wrong yeah um, but to aspire to uh, to aspire to um, uh, to be of a greater positive influence and to fulfill the definition of what it means to be a Muslim leader, as we described, yeah, to be someone who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way, right, onto the, on the straight path for as many people as possible. That's an aspiration which we are supposed to have. So Allah says we are supposed to supplicate. وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama, Make us an imam, an example, right, for the, the righteous, for the God-fearing. You know, for those who are mindful of Allah. So if we're supposed to be those people, I mean, we're asking for that. Allah is telling us to ask for that. Yeah. So what we should desire is the um, the ability and for Allah to use us and to put us in a position whereby we can be a maximum service to him and his deen. Then the specific positions, then the any specific positions that then come our way, we assess them in the context, you know, of uh, in our context, whether they will lead to that objective or not. Yeah. Um, and then we take them on accordingly, right? But we don't, we only desire them for that purpose. We don't desire them. We understand it's just a stepping stone. 
is a stepping stone. It's a route for me to take to bring about benefit. And then that's it. That's all it is. It's nothing beyond that. And there's nothing to get too happy about, about the fact that, you know, now I'm in this particular position, but is it possible to, should you, can you want that? Yeah, of course. Like, you know, classic examples of which I'm sure you're all aware of, which are always brought up in this context, like Yusuf alayhi salam in the Quran, you know, saying, telling the, um, selling the Pharaoh to make him the, uh, basically the, um, well, effectively the chancellor, right? Is it telling, like t saying, yeah, give me that position. So that's something which I think is, uh, um, uh, to be noted all right in your opinion is one a born leader or is leadership some oh there's another one that's come up there should we go with that one okay how to not appear arrogant while still showing that you are confident in a good way again you know what i think sometimes these things can be overthought yeah with respect like i would just say you know oh hang on yeah, the questions have gone i would just say like be yourself basically uh you know i don't think you should worry about appearing arrogant or not like just be confident yeah, be yourself, be confident, be true. And Allah will then put in the heart, people, the hearts of the people, like the sense of your sincerity. You know, when someone loves Allah, then Allah puts the love of that person in the hearts of the others. So don't worry too much about that. You speak to people with a true consciousness of Allah. Yeah, how they then receive you, perceive you, whatever. You know, that's a separate thing. You know, some of you might think I'm being arrogant in some way because I, maybe I'm looking too confident. And somebody else might think it's a different thing. I don't know. I'm just doing my best. It's good actually i can't even see any of you right i just uh, sitting here assuming there's some people on the other side who are listening i'm conscious that okay allah is listening he, he wants me to reflect my experience and the knowledge that little knowledge that i have in the best possible way with yourselves that's it you know i'm then but i have to speak clearly i have to communicate properly confidently clearly in a way that maximizes the chance that you will inshallah you know receive any positive message that i uh that i have yeah so that's it don't worry about it after that and then do the things that we spoke of is one a born leader or is leadership something that can be developed and learned so this sort of nature nurture argument applies to a lot of different things and a lot of different characteristics right can you really you know uh, develop and change i think look i think that uh, everybody has the capability if it depends how you define leadership yeah but if we define leadership as someone who can exert a positive influence on others and show facilitate the path okay the straight path for as many people as possible in different ways then is that something that any, everyone can contribute to? Absolutely, no doubt about that. But the issue isn't that. The issue is we have a very fixed idea in our head of what a leader is, and then we wonder whether, we, whether we're ever going to be that person. Rather than understanding that, no, I am, as a, I am and I have certain innate characteristics, certain innate uh, perhaps skills and talents that Allah has given me, I need to recognize what, like, I need to know myself basically better, recognize what I'm good at, you know, what I'm passionate about, the best way that I can actually serve myself and then find ways to be of service in that way. So sometimes what we try and do is without truly really knowing ourselves, we try and fit ourselves into positions that just exist because we think that's the way to go and you know, be a leader, right? But you can be the best leader at university and never have a position in Islamic society or FOSIS or, or, or. that's also quite possible. You can be the most effective leader. You know? So I don't believe that, I think people are born with I mean, I have, alhamdulillah, now like young children, right? So you can see from a very, very early age, there's certain innate characteristics, right? About, and sometimes very opposite, very, very different, yeah, in, in, in children. So, you know, they are a certain way, there's certain natural ways about them. Can they, can, then things can be developed, can be cultivated, can be nurtured, responsibilities can be given, can be added. They can think about how they want to serve, how they want to add value, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's what we don't do enough of. We don't have enough of these kinds of conversations about like really helping us to know ourselves and then to leverage our particular skills and um, uh, our particular kind of skills and capabilities yeah, to, uh, you know, for the, for the benefit of others. So I do believe that it can be developed, it can be learned, but I also think that there's an innate, like a natural qualities that Allah gives us that it allows us to do that too. Uh, when it comes to Islamic organizations in the UK, I feel that we unfortunately have relatively low standards when it comes to professionalism, accountability and transparency. Have you found this to be true? I'd be interested in any thoughts you have related to this stemming from your experiences. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I think that, look, I don't see that it's necessarily helpful for us to say or think that, you know, Muslim organizations, particularly as opposed to other organizations, have a worse standard. Yeah. Or even a better standard. Like in a way, what does it matter? The reality is whatever it is. And we should always aspire to higher standards. So there is no doubt that sometimes we do think in the context of like some sort of odd, you know, maybe Muslim kind of cultural sort of bubble, right? In terms of the way in which we think, you know, things can or should happen, right? But 
constantly trying to improve standards of transparency, of governance, professionalism, accountability, etc. Like that's not something which some, somehow is like a Western or a non-Muslim notion that we are then adopting. It's just a, you know, a kind of pretty universal uh, human notion of excellence, right? That's what it is. And so we should pursue that. And so, yes, of course, I have seen things. I have probably done things, you know, that fall short okay, of a high standard. But, uh, you know, that if, if you're the worst thing we can do is kind of look at our organizations and say, well, they're like this. I'm not going to, I can't get involved, right? I'm not going to get involved and then kind of look at them in a certain way and then dismiss it because, well, what did you do to then sort help yeah, with that issue or that problem? Um, if you have the knowledge and understanding the ability to raise the standards, we'll go and raise them then. Yeah. I think that's also important. So I think it's a, you know, yes, there are always, you know, you'll always see difficulties and problems. And I think there's lots of, even in recent years, you know, publicly, uh, you know, publicly available information and stories about, you know, charities or Muslim organizations, you know, doing, you know, inappropriate things and wrong things. But we, we hopefully we learn, we move forward, we raise our standards and we keep going in that way. Do you have any recommendations for understanding the seer of the Quran? Well, look, I think it's a combination of things. So um, obviously there's a whole host of sources, right, about, you know, classical contemporary sources helping us to explain uh, or helping us to understand what the Quran you know, what Allah means by certain verses in the Quran and how we should understand it. I would always say to people on this, you know, to do something which I think a lot of people don't do uh, is, um, you know, there is no reason why all of you, by the time you've all finished at university or whatever, you know, masters, whatever course you're doing, that you don't have a very decent, thorough understanding of the contents of the Quran simply because you've read it in the English language. Yeah. So I am fully and always supportive of um, you know, learning the Arabic language, memorizing the Quran, good recitation, all of these things. Yeah, I've spent a lot, large parts of my life involved in all of these things. OK, and I strongly recommend it for those who are capable. But in truth, you know, the reality is most people, many people will, will not have the time or the inclination to go that way. However, that doesn't take away from the fact that you can get a very good sense, at least an overall sense or an understanding of what the contents of the chap of the chap uh, the chapters and the verses in the Quran by simply reading it regularly in the English language. You know, a lot of us, for example, if I say, okay, what are the major themes of chapter number seventeen in the Quran? The majority of us won't know what chapter number seventeen is, let alone all the subject matters within it. We should all be able to do that. Yeah, and you don't need to be like a scholar of Arabic. Yeah, or had have read tons of tafsirs. Just read the actual thing itself, like you read any other book. Yeah, just read it and regularly in the English language, and then ponder and reflect, and just always ask yourself, why does Allah say this? What does it mean for me? What am I going to do as a result? Yeah, that's it. And then that sparks your journey of research, reflection. Or what did the classical, uh, you know, Mufassirun say? Are there any hadith related to this? Or how about other verses we can compare this? Oh, in this place Allah says this, in that place he says that. Bring those together. It becomes a natural, personal, organic journey that way. Yeah? Rather than, again, going through this kind of um, sometimes a bit of a formulaic journey, which for most people doesn't really last very long. Yeah? So it doesn't have to start only with like a deep knowledge of the Arabic, um, uh, you know, Arabic language uh, and all of that. Although, of course, yeah, for higher levels of understanding that is necessary. So I certainly, for most of us, given where most of us probably are, I would certainly say that that is the default starting point. You know, if you don't read the book in its translation form, in a language that you understand on a regular basis, it's unlikely you're ever going to really understand or get a sense of what the, the actual message of the Quran really is. Some people believe women shouldn't be leaders. Is this true? Can you talk about women in leadership, please? Well, given the short time that we have remaining, um, I would say uh, it's my uh, it's my understanding that there is no problem with women being in positions of leadership. Um, certainly not in the context that we're discussing. What are we talking about? We're talking about you know uh, women being presidents of Islamic societies, vice presidents, occupying various positions of responsibility, or beyond Islamic society focus and all of that. You know, in a business context, you know, in a work charitable context, what have you. Can women occupy those positions? Yeah, absolutely. Why not? And I think, frankly speaking, like uh, I think that uh, most of most Muslim organizations, and I certainly know from National Zakar Foundation, where I think we have a decent balance, I think, between uh, male and female uh, kind of, uh, you know, team members that uh, I think if it's too heavily uh, one way or the other, uh, then that, well, that is an that is an imbalance. 
that will probably naturally result in some form of imbalance in the way that things actually are done. Yeah. Um, and probably in some sort of a deficiency in, in the in the outcomes that will result. So I encourage it. And I think that it has its um, challenges, of course, given how the situation is. But I, I, I encourage, you know, I, I encourage a, sort of like an open sort of thing, really, a, a basis on which these things should be, uh, uh, yeah, should be should be done. Obviously, I'm not an expert in female leadership because as a man, it's obviously not, I'm not going to claim to have some great, uh, you know, understanding of the whole subject. But I certainly don't see that it's an issue. Uh, I can only see one question on the screen at the moment. I'm happy to take a couple more if, if there's time. I think um, if you could take one more, that would be great. Okay. Thank you. Oh, no, it looks like there's the, the time slide has expired. Okay. Um, oh, it's uh, Jazakallah Khayyad, thank you so much for um, your time and thank you so much for all of those pertinent lessons which so many of these brothers and sisters including myself first and foremost need with regards to how we approach leadership now and in the future um, something that we always want to polish our intentions on and I've heard I finished my term on ISOC and I'm not I'm external to FOSIS so I'm not really part of these organizations anymore but a lot of the brothers that I spoke to in the last few months who like myself have finished all of them say that they wish they polished and cleaned their intentions and that they constantly reevaluated themselves. So I ask all of you who are already on the committees and organizations and those who will join in the near future to do so. And uh, Iqbal, um, one other thing, I think Ustad Hisham, he said something that's really nice and complimentary to your talk. He mentioned that, um, try to read, uh, if you can, uh, um, before a meeting or maybe after a meeting or before an event, um, asking Allah that he puts ikhlas into your actions and rewards it so that you can start off always in the right way and you don't become slowly corrupted. Barakallahu fi for your time. No problem. And uh, I'll just drop my, um, uh, I'll drop my email address in the chat for, for everyone. So if you, if you'd like to get in touch, uh, you know, follow up or anything, I appreciate that. I didn't get to answer all the questions. So uh, if you're, if you'd like to get in touch and you'd like to um, uh, ask anything or follow up, then I, I'll do my best to be of uh, assistance inshallah. All right. Oh, all the best. Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah bless you all. And may he make us all uh, uh, leaders for the muttaqeen, inshallah. Amen. 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 Amen.